You know, I, I think uh, I can't talk about our economy without um, uh, her talking us through the history of how we got to be a, who we are today in Michigan and, and the Great Lakes. Uh, you know, Harry Truman, I think, said there's nothing new in life. And he was very well read, and most of you know that. Uh, he read all the classics. He said, there's nothing new in life except the history that you don't know. Uh, every th situation, everything, and we need to be informed by that history. Uh, and this looks like a group that appreciates, is thoughtful, and appreciates history. I'm not saying it's an older group. I'm saying <laughs> that you're <laughs> students of history, I am sure. Um, so, and I just also just came from Chicago, where we were convening under the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, uh, which incidentally is an organization that was created by the business leadership of Chicago uh, and uh, leaders from the Midwest in the 20s and 30s uh, when uh, we were in another moment of um, the America first, pull back from uh, the international community, protectionism, nativism was in the air, and this group, no, we need to help each other learn about the world and be affirmatively engaged in the world. And we were convening um, stakeholders, uh, business elected officials, representatives of the governors in the Midwest and Great Lakes, and, and kind of policy thought leaders looking again, as I did once before with Brookings, at like what's the economic uh, agenda and blueprint to help accelerate economic uh, development uh, for more people and places in this Midwest, which now, particularly since, I mean, since the election and our states being uniquely responsible for electing President Trump, no matter what you think of him, uh, it's put the attention on mid, you know, the Midwest and Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania. What is, um, what's up? Uh, are, there appear to be many people, and it's understandable, who responded to what, in my view, was sort of an unfortunate appeal to um, nostalgia. We'll bring back the good old days, the jobs uh, that we used to have, and, and kind of a new nativism, a new uh, um, anti-immigrant, anti-other, and, and fanning those fears. And so when people are optimistic and when they have jobs and their communities are thriving, they're looking forward. They're feeling good about things. They're less vulnerable to appeals to nostalgia, or to um, anti-immigrant, anti-other uh, sentiment. And so obviously, anything we can do to accelerate economic good things for people and their families in, in a lot of the territory where they're not experiencing that in the Midwest, uh, it, 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 it is affecting our politics. That anxiety, that resentment, the politics of resentment, it can heal our politics as well, which has gotten so divided and polarized, unfortunately. And we can, and I've always tried to work together across party lines. It's increasingly hard, but uh, it's what we need to be about. And so, uh, but I was at this event, and we were talking about this Midwest economy. And, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing history. I mean, this region, this was the frontier uh, when we took ownership from Great Britain and Canada of the upper Midwest and Northwest territories. Um, you know, amazing natural bounty was always here, you know, uh, exploited by the tribes for years and years, happily. Um, the traders and trappers, you know, went the, the timber resources, the fertile farmland, the iron ores and copper ores, you know, that were always there. When, when, when the Erie Canal was built that, that opened up this region, particularly Michigan, which was not on kind of the you know southern you know transportation corridor, uh, in 1830 when it opened up, um, thousands and thousands and thousands of people flooded in here, and Michigan's uh, population um, multiplied sevenfold in one decade from 1830 to 1840. People rushed in here because you could sell, you could farm the ground, you could you could ship out the timbers. And, and you know, the growth of this region exploded, uh, first taking advantage of this amazing natural resource and bounty that we had, and then converting all that into you know, processed agricultural goods and manufactured goods. I mean, the birth of the great industries that powered the 20th century are all in this Midwest Great Lakes region. Uh, you know, the, the oil industry actually you know, started in Ohio and Western Pennsylvania, the steel industry in Pittsburgh, and then obviously we, you know, the, we invented the, uh, the game-changing um, assembly line and automobile production industry you know, in Michigan. Uh, Minneapolis-St. Paul was the flour milling capital of the world. Chicago was the stockyards and the trading capital for commodities. Cincinnati was a place on a break on the Ohio River where they 
they chopped up pigs for market and they began to make soap and you know generations later Procter and Gamble and consumer products enterprises were born I mean this is the kind of the story of of our region and you know you, you look around you know, Western Michigan uh, amazing innovators uh, inspired tinkerers uh, whole new uh, industries were born here you know I, I learned when I did this Michigan economic agenda you know the Upton brothers were the first to convert a you know a hand washer and electrified and a great appliance enterprise is born you know right nearby um, in in Kalamazoo they invented the pill Upjohn invented the first pill that you could dissolve. And, you know, a pharmaceutical enterprise is born. The, you know, we know about the paper mills in Muskegon and in Kalamazoo, you know, that provided uh, rich resource. All of these, and Grand Rapids, obviously, people who were making farm implements began to make furniture. And these incredible, you know, still very competitive, now very modern, high-end, you know, furniture makers were born. Uh, so these great industries grew and of course they created great opportunity, jobs, people flooded here from around the world and from the south, the great African American migration came to our industrial cities, large and medium and small. I mean we have more small and medium sized uh, manufacturing based, you know, agricultural processing based communities in the Midwest. It's this landscape. That is who we are. Uh, and you know, folks from Appalachia, where I grew up in West Virginia, you know, came up here to take these good jobs in the machine shops, in the mills, in the plants. You know, when I was working up in the Flint area, I heard more um, West Virginia accents that I hadn't heard since I was growing up there. Because, you know, everybody from the hills came up here for a better life. Uh, and, you know, that's really us. And so part of what I like to remind us in Michigan in particular, we're all migrants here. I mean, the first waves were the Germans and the Finns and the Dutch and the Poles and uh, then the Italians and the Eastern Europeans. But uh, today's migrants are still coming here, but they're people from, of color, they're from the Middle East, they're from Latin and South America, they're Pakistani engineers and Iraqi doctors. You know, so that's part of the challenge we face is that today's immigrants came in here for the same reason that our parents came here. You know, my great-great-grandfather, Austin, was a carpenter in Orton, Waterville, England. When Chicago burned down, he thought there might be work, so he emigrated. He got stuck in Cleveland and grew a carpentry shop that grew into a construction company that built auto plants. And actually, the Austin company, which is now bought out by somebody else, it's, it built the, the plants that the uh, Boeing makes their jets in, including the one that, you know, isn't flying right out in Reading, Washington. So, you know, just these stories are, are about us. Um, and Michigan, you know, is defined by those kinds of innovations and great industries that created great wealth, created lots of jobs. All, most of those jobs, as you know, for generations didn't require a lot of education, uh, but paid well. And, and as you know, across the region, not just here, when globalization, when we face competition, I mean, just think of autos, when the Japanese invasion hit, when they could bring their products here and sell them cheaply, and they were actually, they absorbed how to make quality products from Edward Deming, who first taught us how to make quality products. We kind of got fat and happy. We had the market to ourselves. We were making cars that didn't work very well. And so when the, they invaded, it's like, whoa, we got to wake up. We almost lost our business, right? And as you know, the, all of Michigan, actually all of the Midwest, among all these great industries that kind of powered uh, the 20th century and brought everybody here, uh, you know, the auto and auto supply chain. I mean, in every corner of Michigan, every corner of the Midwest are auto parts and pieces of the car, et cetera. So when that all uh, hit, you know, amazing, dramatic, and, you know, sometimes terrifying restructuring of these industries, you know, which automated and had to get competitive and shed jobs. I mean, it, 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 they're still, we're now making cars and car parts again, thankfully. But as you know, it takes like, it used to take 4,000 people to work, you know, in a big Buick assembly line in Flint. You know, now it's an engine plant that takes 400 people and they're programming robots. They're not, you know, five guys weld in a bumper, you know. So the whole landscape of production, uh, manufacturing, which we heavily rely on, fewer people, higher skill levels, uh, and you know, on whole pieces of these industries disappeared. Um, 
Like who, you were giving me the example of down the street, uh, was it the Feather Company? Featherbone. Featherbone, which started out making, and then made diapers, and then is gone to Georgia, right? For lower cost. I mean, that's a, a story that you know you could replicate around here. So you know, big challenges uh, in this region in Michigan from that. Uh, and across the upper Midwest, you know, that's what brought the name Rust Belt. It was sort of these factory towns, company towns where the anchors are gone, poof, you know, what do they got to do? Um, but part of what we're talking about in Chicago is um, many places, it is a different economy. It's, it's urbanizing, it's knowledge driven. Uh, we're all working in front of computers, you know, in one form or another, but we're working in uh, education institutions and in hospitals and law firms, you know, in financial and business services and marketing. Uh, where there's fewer people out working in those plants and, and uh, facilities. Uh, and, you know, we have in our region and in Michigan, uh, some of the communities that are, have turned the corner, uh, that are hot houses of a more diverse economy. Certainly the bigger metros with Detroit and Cleveland coming along a little slower because they have such big challenges of exodus of wealth and people. But Minneapolis is no longer the flour milling city, capital of the world. It's a diverse, you know, tech, finance, hopping young people. Um, Pittsburgh on the other end of the region is, you know, they lost all their steel jobs. They had an exodus of people and wages. <laughs> Now they're back and they're thriving. And it's because they have another feature of our region and Michigan, we got great universities. And economic activity, any of the big university towns like Ann Arbor where I live is just thriving. Because that's where all the talent, all the innovation, we were talking, Billy Ford and our former governor lived there, you know. Uh, and so there's lots of economic activity around universities. And that's what explains Pittsburgh's comeback is Carnegie Mellon and the University of Pittsburgh uh, grew in IT, robotics, uh, healthcare, medical services. <laughs> so much of the reasons come back, but we have all these smaller and medium sized former factory towns that have lost their anchor. And you know, that's where the kind of anxiety is and the lack of jobs. And you know, we, it's around here, right? But so what's the future of our economy? And you, know, you can begin to see it, and I'll try to you know, just illustrate it anecdotally, and then talk about you know, what's important, what we should be doing more of to help juice it along. Um, if you just look around, you know, this region, um, you know, up in Muskegon, you know, here's, a, here's the, first it was paper mills and then it was, what, Scott Paper and big chemical and big uh, manufacturing on this beautiful natural harbor, right? I mean, all across the region and in Michigan, like w these great industries that we built, we built them on the water and they made a huge mess. I mean, literally, you know, toxic. Um, so Muskegon, like 30 years ago, um, they built a Holiday Inn up there, maybe 40 years ago, with windows, rooms that didn't face the waterfront, which is, you know, to just get your head around that. It's a waterfront community. And this is not atypical, you know, where they build a hotel so you couldn't see the water because it's such a mess, you know, right? So, and you know, Muskegon is gonna be fine in the long run because in part, how, there's only so much piece of real estate on the Great Lakes. And when you clean it up and create access to it and you maybe have a marina or, you know, a, a, a hotel that overlooks the water and brew pubs and, you know, this is a place people wanna be and live and work. And that's what happened in Traverse City. You know, they cleaned up their cherry canneries 40 or 50 years ago. Uh, and it's a lifestyle choice location for professionals who are wanting to uh, live and work in a beautiful place, who can do their thing from anywhere in a wired world. You, know, you get tech startups up there getting VC dollars from Ann Arbor, because you know, who would want, if you, if you live in Grand Traverse Bay, but it's because it's such a, it's a beautiful lifestyle. So that's one path for many of our communities to leverage the kind of natural assets, the water assets. Um, and, and that's what Grand Rapids has done in part with their riverfront. But there's also, um, look at Kalamazoo as a great example. It doesn't have a major un research university. It's not like Madison, Wisconsin or Ann Arbor. It was you know, paper milling that f totally polluted the river and they buried their river. So you couldn't even see it in downtown. And they had then Upjohn and Pfizer, these great uh, uh, pharmaceutical enterprise, poof, they're gone just like other communities that lost their big anchors. Uh, and 
So what did they do? And they were losing bodies from their, down, from their city, from their downtown. The Kalamazoo schools, which were better performing than most urban schools, were still losing to the suburbs, you know, Portage. Well, they did a number of smart things as a you know, classic older industrial city that lost its anchors. One is they, they, their economic development folks kept some of those pharma talent, you know, the bioscientists and started new bioscience firms. And they had Stryker as a, uh, a medical products firm that has been growing. But they kept some of the bio pharma talent. They worked hard to redevelop their downtown. Uh, and make it attractive place to live and work and walk, including, like I told someone here, the government put money into Bell's Brewery as an economic development effort, one of the better investments they made, you know. Um, but the main thing they did is, you know, they said, look, the future for communities is about places that value education. And we're gonna mark ourselves as a community that's committed to education, and today higher education. You, you may not also know Kalamazoo and Michigan was the first place in the country where the community came together to tax themselves to provide a free high school education in 1858. First place in the country when high school wasn't for everybody, it was for the well-off families, right? Other taxpayers fought them, you know, sued them. We don't want to tax ourselves for free high school. They won the lawsuit and, you know, free high school became the norm. Then, you know, 12 years ago, they created this Kalamazoo Promise. Guaranteed, free higher education at a Michigan University or community college if you go through the Kalamazoo Public Schools. Guess what? The main result of that has been, yes, more people have been thinking they can and getting higher education, which is essential. They did it for economic development reasons. We want to be marked as the community that values higher education. But people are moving back into Kalamazoo. It's, I mean, we failed miserably in this country at urban policy to try to revive older cities. Here, one elegant stroke and a couple other things they did smart. You know, people are moving back in, middle class families, moving back into the city. That's, you know, a, a great example. Look at what Grand Rapids has done. You know, it was furniture making, car parts, you know, it's, it's a real old, older industrial city. They worked real hard on their downtown redevelopment, including stitching the river back in, it moved anchor institutions from Grand Valley and museums and, and created a fabric of downtown activity, particularly young people, but all people like to, a place where you can walk around, you can go out to eat, you can, there's people down there. There's now, you know, apartments and offices. Um, they, they're lead employers, you know, Steelcase and uh, what's the other furniture maker? Steelcase Herman Miller. Herman Miller, you know, it stayed on the cutting edge of innovation. They didn't like, you know, slow down. And you get other big employers and my favorite example of kind of the, the work of tomorrow and jobs of tomorrow is there's a guy, Fred Keller, CEO of Cascade Engineering. Cascade Engineering is a big auto parts maker, plastic injection molded auto parts. He employs like 5,000 people. If you look under the hood of your car, what do you see? You see plastic auto parts now, right? So that's what they did. But Fred was kind of forward looking. He said, look, the auto is going to be a diminished business in some form, you know, over time. So let's get into the coming things. He started to make green products, disposable uh, products, solar panel holders, you know, the, the, that go on roofs, which is a growing enterprise. But the, my favorite one is he, let's, let's, they use their technology, their competencies from making auto parts to make a simple plastic device that you can take over to the developing world and local folks there can use it to clean water and have safe drinking water. Uh, and 60% of people in the developing world who are in hospital or sick are there because of um, dirty drinking water. And here they're solving at low cost a, a global problem of public health and doing it you know, from here. Uh, and the, the big benefit is you, Fred's daughter was running this piece of the operation. She was, and I were on the radio, and I can kind of get hyperbolic about you know the work of the future and the economy of the future. Uh, and she was more hyperbolic than I. It's like no, oh, and these you know the young people, the kids that we're always worried about leaving our communities, you know, are they're tripping over themselves to intern at at Cascade because they want to be involved in that work. They want to be solving the world's problems. 
Uh, so the engineers and others, you know, environmental uh, causes, you know, work for a major manufacturer and solve the world's problems. I saw the same example um, in Whirlpool. I was telling someone else, Whirlpool is involved as we speak in um, creating like the kitchen and appliances of tomorrow that use net zero water, zero energy practically, saves money, uh, obviously an attractive product, you know, cutting edge technology for the homes of tomorrow. Uh, and I went over there to meet with some of them, or I saw them at a sustainable business forum and over here somewhere. And in other pieces, you know, yeah, all of these many communities around here are lifestyle communities, you know, just like you see with Traverse City. So that's, you know, a clear path. But, and there's like these young hipster engineers. <coughs> You know, I thought, who'd have thunk hipsters, you know, in Benton Harbor? Uh, there aren't enough of them to make a giant fraternity of hipsters, which, you know, I was at this hotel in Chicago, which, this is an aside, but it was so hysterical. Twelve years ago when I went there to speak, they put me up at the Chicago Athletic Club, which is this glorious old club on, like, on Michigan Ave, like fronting right across from the Millennial Park. But it was this old musty club, though it had these really cool spaces, uh, including like we had a, I took my son with me, he was like 12 or so, and was like, we had this room with like 20 foot ceilings and a fireplace. But otherwise it was like this sort of dank musty club. Uh, I went in there, yes, two days ago. Oh my God, the place is overrun by hipsters, like rich hipsters, like 30 something. It, it was turned into a boutique hotel. And it's got all these you know, workspaces and bars and game room, you know, with, uh, and lights, you know, like seen on TV. It's like, oh my God, I'm feeling old and I'm feeling not very wealthy. You know, <laughs> look at the. But anyway, so these hipsters at Ben Harbor are solving, you know, they're engineering the solutions for the technologies of the future, which are also job creators. When, you make and, when we make and sell these products or create the new version, um, then that's new jobs in the coming things, solving the world's problems of food, medical. Well, look, look at two Grand Rapids. Grand Rapids started from like nothing in terms of a research, health, medical, you know, complexes. Those are great engines of economic activity, growing, you know, business, healthcare, wellness, uh, solution, you know, treatment and new discovery of drugs and medicines. There's a lot more money to be made making your body parts, I don't know if anybody has any, but that machined um, hip, you know, is a precision machine thing, right? Bioengineered thing. You can sell that puppy for tens of thousands of dollars uh, where the same thing, you know, put in a car is, you know, a few hundred dollars. So, you know, that's where the action is in, in this work of tomorrow. Now, what do we need to do to, to juice it um, and do more of? Uh, to accelerate good things. Obviously, you know, providing resources for communities to, to be able to first provide basic services. We have in Michigan a huge problem. So many of our municipalities got no tax base left, particularly if they've had population loss. They have, I mean, Benton Harbor, I'm sure, is this case. Flint's the extreme case. When, when your tax base is gone, but you have infrastructure built for 200,000 people, uh, you, can't, you can't afford to repair the water systems, much less have arts and parks and libraries and things that make a community a place people want to live or stay, right, or come to. So, you know, those kinds of investments in basic municipal services and, and uh, sort of the blocking and tackling, plus the arts, parks, amenities, and really young people, you know, they don't, it's ironic, they don't want to use cars anymore. They want to have bike options and transportation and other ways to get around. And this is another smart thing Grand Rapids did is the business leader said, look, we're going to set goals for this community. We're going to set goals for saving energy. We're going to set goals for saving water. We're going to be the greenest, and they are the greenest mid-sized city. And we're going to set goals for getting people out of cars and onto public transportation, which is what they're doing around the world. Because we can't, everybody can't in China and India, you know, in Pakistan can't be driving a car. Um, or, or if they do, the planet's toast, you know, and that's what's been happening. So, you know, th that's a piece of it. We've got to, you know, everybody needs a post-secondary higher education. Uh, the high school diploma as a terminal degree, and you could go walk down the street and get a job, that's gone, right? Uh, even in production work, you're, you're, you're programming the robot. You know, it's a different job. So, 
I was happy we were pushing, I've been working with a group of our universities, colleges, K-12 and, and others to try to push. We need, we need more of our people. We have more adults than almost any other state who are already out in the labor market with just a high school diploma. They need a post-secondary credential, certificate, technical training, degree, even better, higher is better. Uh, and because there's a lot of jobs for hipster engineers, and there, but there are also jobs for people like my son, the anthropologist with a computer science minor. Uh, that doesn't hurt. Uh, so we need everybody to get a, the governor did announce, we're trying to get Snyder to step up more on the talent agenda. Um, he got distracted by Flint and then Detroit schools. Didn't do too much, but um, Governor Whitmer announced in her state of the state, we're gonna set a goal, which is what we should, 60% of our people, we're now at 45, have a post-secondary credential or degree, and we're gonna pay for, we need higher, higher learning to be affordable again. We've cut support for learning, basically, in Michigan at all levels. So adults, we're gonna retrain you, pay for that, get a credential, young people emerging from college, will make post-secondary two years of community college or two years equivalent of university, essentially, no cost. So that's great, that will be, a, if that happens, hopefully it will, you know, that will be hugely important. Another huge thing we need to do is, you know, we, we gotta fuel these engines of learning, research, discovery, innovation. We've got the, one of the best public universities and certainly community college networks in the world. We've been defunding them, which is why tuitions are higher than they should be, and working families sometimes don't think and can't even afford to go to one of our great public universities. So we need to invest in that, and those are the engines, anchors of, of new economic activity, working with the private sector, as you know, try to give you some examples of. Uh, so these engines of innovation, another great innovation, you know, that came out of Michigan and the Midwest, this, public, this great public university, you know, and the land grant university. Land grant university was created uh, during the Civil War. It was um, created by the Morrill Act, which basically said, you know, public education is is very forever important, and we want these great institutions to educate the everyman, not just the elites. High quality, low cost education for the masses, and to fuel agriculture, commerce, and industry, very purposefully. The first. The first, land, I kept saying the first land grant university was MSU, it's actually Kansas. But the, the real first one's MSU. And you know, what an amazing innovation. Uh, that, you know, look at all the good that's come out of those when they're affordable. So we need to invest in these centers of research, learning, discovery, which are the fulcrums for economic activity. It's, you know, I'll give you just one example. We're, we need to, you know, be on the cutting edge of the work of the future, not just the great industries that we created, you know, with the pill or, you know, Battle Creek, the cereal industry, you know, that was 100 years ago, or the auto industry. We need to be the ones spawning the industries of tomorrow and new jobs, and we can do it because we got the horsepower and the people and the innovation engines and companies and universities. Um, I don't know if some of you may be using this, or I didn't know about it. There's some U of M research smarty pants in tech, um, they developed this cybersecurity technology that probably you're using when you buy something from Amazon or whatever, you know, it's, it's a way to keep your information safe. It came out of uh, U of M, they started it as a startup, it grows to now employing 500, 800 people in uh, Detroit and Ann Arbor. It was, they just had their first public offering last year, it was uh, bought or sold, they sold you know, shares in the company for over a billion dollars, which is called a unicorn. It's like Silicon Valley sized, you know, new startup. And Cisco Systems just bought it, though so they're gonna keep it here for $2.3 billion. And so now you have this, th so that, that meant, I mean, one of the implications is, there's now 30 or 40 new tech millionaires, multi-millionaires in Ann Arbor, Southeast Michigan, who are gonna go and start the new tech company uh, with their money. That's how you get the kind of Silicon Valley-like, you know, startup culture and new startup activity in the coming thing like cybersecurity, which we can do here in Michigan. We got the horsepower, brains, innovation, people. So that's the economy of the future that we need to, to kind of juice along. There's other, obviously, parts of the equation, but um, I hope that it was responsive to what you asked me to talk about.